Dennis is the supervisor for the main shell, uh, shellfish management program, and he supervises the three area biologists who all work directly with the municipal shellfish program. Good morning. Uh, as Cole said, my name is Dennis Nolt. I'm a supervisor of the shellfish management program. So by and large, I, uh, will my area biologist be uh, deal with all of the municipalities and the soft shell plan management work. However, it's a shellfish management program. There are other species we look at. Mussels in particular are one that have been uh, a recent one. So we've looked at abilities to assess and evaluate these areas that have intertidal mussel resources. Um, it's extremely expensive to, in the past to do overflights uh, of them and evaluate the resources when we have areas that are competing resources. Um, so this happened a couple years ago. We decided to look at an assessment um, for a conflicting area. And it happens to be um, the Jordan River uh, in Ellsworth. So here's the, uh, the Bar Harbor Airport. This upper area here is the uh, Jordan River uh, Mussel Conservation Area. The area in particular we're talking about is down here in the mouth. Um, we have a bunch of aquaculture uh, leases all the way around in the area. It's a heavy utilized area for both uh, lobstering. In here on the flats in particular we're going to be looking at are areas where we have both uh, both species of marine worms, both blood and sand worms harvested. There's a lot of uh, clamming activity going on in all sides of the mussel industry, both for seed and wild mussel dragging, traditionally. Oops. So in particular, what happened uh, back in 2015, we decided we got some money from an individual that came up uh, that has a drone to look at doing a, an assessment of the area for uh, muscle resources by drone. And uh, it became a challenge, unfortunately, when we decided to set it up because proximity to the airport and the changes to the, the regulations by FAA to fly a drone within close proximity to the airport. This individual has been working with uh, the FAA for a long time period. It was a moving target for us. We move forward. However, this is the, the two areas in particular that we're looking at. This happens to be the Lemoyne side. These dots are the tracks that we did uh, our initial assessment on. Same thing with here on the Trenton uh, side of the airport. Those are all, uh, those are basically 100 foot uh, samples. So we're looking at about 1,000 feet each for those transects. Hit the wrong button. So we went out in, uh, this is the April of the 2016 time period um, on the area. So this is the area up in uh, the outer part of uh, Friendship's Bay looking across the Bar Harbor. This is the Lemoyne side. We can certainly see there's a pretty significant muscle resource in there. Um, and we're assessing over here. This happens to be the Trenton side. The inner part of the Trenton side has a whole bunch of rocks and boulders in there. Uh, but it's a significant mussel resource. It has a fair amount of, of uh, worms and clams in there also. So we use uh, highly technical equipment here in the state of Maine. Um, when we put out our plots, we're using basically uh, a wooden stake. We cut down a, uh, a yardstick, painted orange with a piece of flagging. And we ran our transects across the flat. And you can see here, um, as we're dragging our, our sled across the flat, we're putting out stakes. This is just showing the muscle resources in different areas. There's quite a size range. There's some alive, there's some dead. The intention of this aspect of it is opposed to doing an overflight and saying there's muscles there, having a hand sample, do a, a full survey. The thought process was could we fly a drone, fly a drone at a certain height, take a high digit resolution picture, and do a physical count by picture so we can look at a, a legal to sublegal aspect of the assessment. It wouldn't really get into the whole live to dead ratio, but it was something that the thought process we need to look at. And then the bigger one was an overflay overall, so we get a percent coverage. Um, and as you can see, this is the success of it. Um, <clears throat> this picture here, that little green chunk in here, is actually the stake. We couldn't get the, the uh, drone permit. Two months later, that's what our stakes look like out on the mud. You couldn't find them anywhere. Um, and that was a challenge on our end of it. We did go out and we decided to look at a uh, hand sampling of it. We can see there's a, a two inch clam ring. 
The assessment uh, is pretty thick, nice looking muscles. So we went out and again, did our, our hand sampling. Uh, some of this is on, this happens to be on the Trenton side. This is a drag mark from a permit that was issued for a limited harvest of, of some seed resources. Um, and underneath some of these tracks, uh, right here, we can see that there are clams in there, so if they're, they're dragged across appropriately at the right time periods, clams were underneath there, they were living and doing fine. Again, on our hand sampling, our assessment of this area, Again, highly technical scientific equipment. That's how we measured our uh, subsamples. Huge volumes of, of mussels in a wide range of uh, sizes. We had, uh, you know, terrible work environment to work out there when we were doing those assessments. And here's some of the examples of what we found in the 2016 uh, time period for that initial hand sampling. Again, we got pushed out because of the drone. We couldn't fly it. We can see our size range, this is in millimeters. We had some stuff that was barely legal, a huge volume of sublegal product, right around that one inch to just over one inch uh, size range. So when we looked at both areas, we totaled them out. We had totals, sublegals, um, and we had a densities for bushels per acre, uh, which is uh, pretty high. A little, well, actually quite low on the, on the legal size when we look at the amount of acreage per area. And this is just for the assessed areas. The problem with this is, how long are they going to live, and the accuracy of making those guesses. Because when we were doing the survey, those of you who have done clam surveys, you're going across that flat, you have a zeros, and you have high density numbers. All that put into a picture becomes a calculation for a percent coverage. For the muscle end of it, it's kind of that similar aspect of it, and you're also looking at percent coverage, sometimes it's not always accurate. There's where the drone later on came into effect. So we went back out in 2016, we finally got the permit from FAA to fly the drone, very limited. Um, and we went back out, did the exact same aspect, putting our stakes back out uh, across the flat. We have obviously some drag marks on here. We also had uh, between the 2016, 2017 uh, winter year, where we had a lot of uh, that, that small muscle set. We had one heck of a winter kill. So in when you have uh, low tide, uh, at a night time period with uh, very little ice coverage, you'll have a huge mortality or can have huge mortalities of juvenile mussels sitting on that flat. And that appears to have happened. When we looked at mortality rates uh, on some of the stuff, we are having upwards of 50 plus percent mortalities of some of our smaller mussels. So this is what the flat looks like uh, in the areas. This stake here, there's a stake that's over here and there's a line that runs down here, I don't know how well it shows up. That's actually a stake from the previous years. Um, and these are literally in the same areas that we're having it. Certainly the muscle resource has, looks like has dropped in some fashion. So now we get into the drone aspect. Um, and this is not your happy homeowner, uh, easy drone to pick up off the shelf. It's a pretty expensive piece of equipment, even though it's small. Uh, one of Alex Lower's drones that he has, has the ability to actually tow a submersible, a uh, small, very small submersible vehicle. This one here has the abilities for um, a whole bunch of, of light filters uh, when we look at this stuff. So we certainly know what the UV um, and the color filtration rates of certain uh, seaweeds and things like that. And this is what we're trying to look at for our muscles. And this is basically the drone here. It's going to be a quick video of, of what the drone looks like when it takes off. Oops, have to hit on it. Um, there's the zone starting up. It's shot up. This is fully autonomous. He has no control over this. He programs it, hits a button, and off it goes. It's sitting, it got uh, orientated, and it's shooting off to its positions. Um, this is a full DG, DGPS uh, drone. Oops. Uh, Capabilities, we literally GPS all of our coordinates. That was all programmed in. He set the areas they had to be. He had some exclusion zones that the FBA put into it. He literally put it onto the mud, hit a button, and away it went. It did its thing. Um, he has the ability to control it by hand, but when it's doing this work, it's fully autonomous when it's doing it. So here's one of our um, the initial assessments where we kind of uh, went through it. This is at uh, a a three meter height um, is where we were doing this assessment at. 
Uh, we certainly know that it's 4.5 um, meters per second is what the speed of the, the uh, drone is running at. I'm going to just run this one quickly. Hopefully. Should come up. There we go. So there's where the drone is going to be taking off from. It shoots off to this transect and it's going to be running down along this transect here. And here's where it's up, it's running, and you're going to see a stake in a minute, it's going to orientate, hopefully you don't have vertigo, <laughs> and it's going to come along, there's one of our stakes that just zipped past, and it's going to stop, and we can see there's a reading here, it says 12 feet, it's going to wind up dropping down in altitude, down to about uh, 5 feet or so, the wind kept pushing it off, and there's where we've, we uh, found out what our problem was. So the thought process was it could come in, stop, take that high digital picture. Well, this is set at sea level and it's looking at altitude. This flat actually comes up off of, uh, from sea level at low tide several feet. That change in that angle really screwed up how we could do any type of accurate assessment on it. And the wind couldn't hold it stable. So one of those intention process, uh, or intended uh, ends for us to an assessment for counting on a picture like this didn't work. The next end is, is this is at 30 meters at height and this is where we really gained a lot of our oops, let me get to this, the picture itself. So this is going to be along that same transect um, and it's flying similar speeds again at, at uh, 30 meters so we're almost at 100 feet for most of the aspect. It's going to take off and it's going to run down along the same transect. This is the Trent side. We could not do the Lemoyne side because of the FAA permits. Even though we're close to the airport, we're far away from the, the actual end of the, the uh, uh, runway. So you can see we're up much higher. It's going to orientate and it's going to slowly travel along. And this is taking video and pictures, high uh, digital resolution pictures, as it goes along. And we can see some of this stuff is muscle, some of this is actually seaweed. Um, and we're going to run into, you actually see some footprints along this area, and sometimes you can see some stakes. So this is running along one of the high points of that flat, and we're able to do this. And this is kind of what's called mowing the lawn. We have transects all the way across that whole area uh, for assessing it at this uh, um, 100 foot level. There's some footprints you can see right there of us walking where our stakes are at. Out of that, when we looked at our assessments, I'm going to need my glasses to read this. So on here, um, for the 2017, we went out and did a, a continuation of, a, of hand sampling um, in the spring, and then we went back out in the fall and did a, an additional assessment um, of hand sampling. Those numbers then get put into how we look at the, uh, the total standing crop in those areas. And you can see, this is kind of similar to what we had from the previous years. There isn't a lot of recruitment going on, but it seems to be on that high flat, slow growing. We're not seeing that real pushover. It was nice to see this bump. We certainly saw from the spring to the fall a huge move over in the shift. We have a nice set of real small seed. However, the problem is, is the numbers. These numbers are low, and here's where the mortality race was what, okay, uh, what kicked in. So this wind up, you know, this is a very low number with high mortality rates. I didn't put the mortality rates in here in particular. So what came out of this whole aspect is this neat picture here. The blue is mussels. You can see some of this is green, that's actually seaweed. We're able to then accurately, um, in using uh, computer programs to look at that mowed lawn of this area of Trenton, accurately say, that's definitely mussels, what's mud, and what's not. So within this, we're able to, to look at that total end of it, so the total standing crop for mussels was 3.65 acres. So not a whole heck of a lot over almost a 20 acre area that was assessed at three acres had actual mussels on it, we looked at for percent coverage. So when we plug those numbers in, certainly the, the, the standing crop in that area kind of goes down into the tank. The neat thing uh, is we can accurately and easily assess that aspect now of a percent coverage on a much higher level. Unfortunately, we can see there's some mussels out here 
in the water. Uh, the computer was not able to tell the difference between uh, a muscle that was just subtidal into the water aspect. This works real well for intertidal. Um, we know there's capabilities where we can now not look at, at the seaweed. So that's a great aspect for us. In the past, when there was an old flight done, you couldn't tell what was muscle and what was seaweed. You had to physically go out there and, and look at that, and then you still weren't really doing a percent coverage aspect of it. And uh, I want to get into my thank yous here. Uh, Alex Lowe from MotionWorks, um, he has actually come up and do some more work with us uh, gratis. He's got a, a new um, filters on his computer, We're gonna, uh, on this uh, drone. We're going to fly the same area, uh, continuation. College Atlantic, um, uh, uh, Dr. Chris uh, Peterson gave us a big help with some of his students. Um, I want to thank Acadia uh, Aqua Farms, uh, Moosebeck Mussels, and Michael Manning. These were the aquaculturists and the mussel uh, harvesters in the area that all participated in, in dealing with us, putting stakes out and saying, hey, please avoid our stakes. Um, and that's a tough thing for them to do. Uh, my DMR Lemoyne staff, they were great in helping us out. My Turia biologist, uh, Hannah Annis and Heidi for helping out on that. And uh, Tora Johnson from the University of Maine, Machias, was a, was a big help um, on doing that computer aspect for GIS. Okay, and I'll take questions. Any questions for Dennis? Yeah. What do you plan to do with your conclusion? Um, our conclusion. So we're still in the middle of writing up this assessment. It's a snapshot. It's one, you know, time period, one month or one year. We really need to look at this on a bigger picture. Um, we're fortunate that we can go out and do this again. Uh, certainly, the conclusion that we got out of this is: boy, if we can very quickly and cheaply fly a drone, get a percent coverage of that area, very quickly go out and hand sample targeted muscles, so we don't have to do long, long transects. We can target where the muscles are, get that age size range, put that into our formula with our percent coverage from that drone, and get a much more accurate assessment of those intertidal muscle resources. Yes? A lot of that video looked like there was a, a large amount of glare, and I'm wondering, did you ever try different times of day, early in the morning, at dusk, or? Um, no, we didn't. It's. The FAA part was hard enough on timelines and getting that to work. So they did when you had to work. There were, yeah, we had a very narrow window on some of that aspect of it. Um, we had to literally have uh, an FAA uh, radio because of planes coming in into the area. However, the thought process was using high uh, sunlight, low tide visibility to look at those subtitle resources, the shallow, very shallow subtitle resources also. Unfortunately, when we plug it through the program to assess the, the UV filter of what is a muscle, what's a, a, um, a rock, what's a seaweed, it wasn't able to do it subtitled. So now I think we can look at it with this new system at any time period. Thank you, Dennis.